In recent weeks, we have seen a very hard pushback against conspiracy theories in the mainstream media. The argument made in its most simplified sense is that if you believe in conspiracy theories, you might do a mass shooting, or you'll at least enable a lot of people getting hurt, even contracting diseases because of anti-vax propaganda. A recent Yahoo News exclusive detailed for the first time an FBI intelligence bulletin from the Bureau's Phoenix field office that has laid the groundwork for the media's blanket mass reporting on linking people who believe in these uh, dangerous conspiracy theories with violence, other perceived harmful consequences, and even domestic terrorism. This previously unpublicized document was claimed to have been obtained only by Yahoo News, and they were the only outlet that had access to the original source. Journalist Jaina Winter, who exposed this or wrote this article, did not share how she obtained the document when an independent investigation of the validity of this intelligence bulletin was made. Not even the National FBI press office would confirm or deny the validity of this document. The Yahoo article says that, quote, the FBI for the first time has identified fringe conspiracy theories as a domestic terrorist threat and describes conspiracy theory driven domestic extremists as a growing threat. It lists a number of arrests, including some that haven't been publicized related to violent incidents motivated by fringe beliefs. The document also mentions the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting, QAnon, which they say is a network of people that believes in the deep state, that it's real and that the objective is to take down Trump. And it also mentions Pizzagate, which they misconstrue as, quote, the theory that a pedophile ring, including Clinton associates, was being run out of the basement of a Washington DC pizza restaurant. Unquote. Completely ignoring the biggest reason why this became controversial in the first place, mainly the WikiLeaks Podesta emails that showed us a glimpse of a strange world of coded language and bizarre rituals that they called spirit cooking. Intentionally making it sound dumb and not credible is part of the tactic to delegitimize. Omission, misrepresentation and wordplay are major tools used by those seeking to cover up such rumors as opposed to just listening to available material, or at least let people interested in it pursue this on their own terms without being singled out as, as dangerous for being curious about stunning revelations about people working in the White House and close to presidents uh, and what they're involved in. So what happened? Well, a deranged shooter showed up and allegedly decided to act on a small portion of the information related to these strange rumors, and then they were able to dismiss everything as nonsense and bury the entire story to protect a network that might have been engaged in similar criminal activities like Jeffrey Epstein actually was convicted of doing. The Epstein case showed us that something like that has actually happened before with the involvement of some of the most elite clientele. In a revealing follow-up to this document, which was widely reported by the largest media outlets, there was a piece in Time.com titled Conspiracy Theories Might Sound Crazy, But Here's Why Experts Say We Can No Longer Ignore Them. This is an interesting article because it dove a little bit deeper and uh, talked with the experts about this issue. These experts have uh, dismissed claims out of hand because, well, because they're just wrong, because it's ridiculous to believe that there are conspiracies, right? And that it's just a matter of fact, because we say so. So, so the argument in the time.com piece is essentially, well, given that conspiracies are wrong, how do we stop people from believing in them? Because supposedly now there's a lot of people going out and doing uh, dangerous things uh, in the name of these conspiracies. So the expert doesn't actually spend any time debunking or deal with any of the claims of the various dangerous conspiracies. Instead, the approach is to try to decode the psyche of the kind of person that it's attracted to a conspiracy as a way of, in their own way, finding a pattern that describes the reason behind something, namely the psychology of the person drawn to conspiracy theories. Ironically, this is a method that they themselves actually attribute to conspiracy theorists all the time. The explanation is that people seek a simplified, a one-size-fits-all quick answer that doesn't unpack anything in detail, but still kind of manages to explain everything in a satisfactory way without having to, uh, without having the subject who is looking for an explanation actually engage themselves 
any further in the material. In other words, it's a lazy approach so that things can be dismissed out of hand, irrespective of how, well, either reasonable, plausible, or fringe the material actually is that's being discussed. So in essence, this tactic that they project onto others, onto conspiracy theorists, is actually what these experts in conspiracy theories engage in themselves. One interesting portion of the article says that, quote, millions of people all over the world, including by one estimate half of the US population, believe in conspiracy theories. Today that figure might even be higher according to political scientists and psychologists who study the phenomena. Since researchers have not tracked these trends over time, it's difficult to determine whether the number of people who believe in conspiracy theories has risen over the years. But experts, and now the FBI, argue an average person's exposure to them has certainly increased, in large part because conspiracy theories are now more easily disseminated on social media. Among the most prominent peddlers of misinformation on social media, experts say, is uh, President Donald Trump. Platforms like YouTube and Facebook have also given life to conspiracy theories and allowed many to go viral. And speaking to one specific example, they say in the article that the theory was mostly harmless but highlights how YouTube, which boasts more than 1 billion users, is part of the problem. So let's translate what that means. Freedom of speech on the internet is bad. Free flow of information is a problem and the unwashed masses having access to technologies that enables you to share things on major platforms and publishers' websites on an even playing field with huge establishment funded media outlets without any restrictions or limitations is a huge problem. Trump is also the problem. Orange man bad. Orange man bad. Forget the Russia hoax peddled by the mainstream media for several years now. Forget the weapons of mass destruction lie, which uh, brought us endless wars, millions of people dead, and millions of refugees fleeing into Europe. I take the fact that he develops weapons of mass destruction very seriously. There is no doubt that Saddam Hussein now has weapons of mass destruction. He doesn't believe in public dissent. He said the Iraqis had built a mobile biological weapons program. They had to be stopped. In fact, they can produce enough dry biological agent in a single month to kill thousands upon thousands of people. I know for a fact that he's poisoned his own people. One problem, it wasn't true. Forget about Operation Mockingbird, information warfare, psychological operations, state propaganda, academics and journalists intentionally inserting their political views and bias into works sold to us as objective. No, the real problem is the person that America elected as president and the ability of those people to voice their unvetted, unapproved, unwashed opinions on publishers' websites like YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So this is the method that the establishment have chosen to destroy independent sources and uh, alternative media outlets. Smear and defame, we should not be allowed to question the expertise of these experts and their motivations, or if they have an agenda. Neither should we be allowed to ask just how little they actually know about things that they have not bothered to look into. Because, well, on the face of it, it's just absurd, they tell us. So, why bother with facts if your mind is already made up? The kind of things that have been exposed in the Jeffrey Epstein case and now the Ghislaine Maxwell defamation lawsuits are things that we were told were just crazy conspiracies, that those kinds of things didn't really happen in the real world. It was just a conspiracy theory. Speaking to the first paragraph that we read earlier, if millions of people believe in uh, conspiracy theories, what defines it as being fringe? The objectivity of what an authority says, is that always going to be considered as the final truth? The more something deviates from that uniform version of reality, the more fringe it is, I guess? Is that how this goes? If something is popular, I agree, that does not make it the truth. That is a fallacy, but appeal to authority is also a fallacy. The truth is the truth regardless of who says it, or how many or few believe in it. If we are not allowed to look at a claim for ourselves, have access to the information backing it up or debunking it to be able to make up our own minds, then we are in a very creepy and frankly dangerous territory.
The document, the FBI bulletin, spurred a string of articles from the most prestigious publications that specifically mentioned that, quote, fringe political conspiracy theories very likely motivate some domestic extremists to commit criminal, sometimes violent activity. Notice the sometimes and in some cases. So if millions of people believe something, who is going to tell us what we can or can't believe? And what will they do if people refuse to give up those beliefs? Throughout history, establishments in their time have enforced rigid versions of reality and the world that we live in now. In some cases, they resort to hangings or burning people alive that believed something different, even if they could be proven, even if those beliefs later became recognized as the truth and the reality that we know today. The lessons from that history is a sharp and clear warning. We might not know what lie we're being peddled today that might be refuted tomorrow by, frankly, brave individuals who refuse to bow to the establishment and keep going regardless. I believe that we don't know everything and that there are many falsehoods today sold to us as truths because it serves the priests of the cult and the Brahmin class at the very, very top. It helps to keep them in power. If they criminalize our ability to read, listen, watch, speak, or disseminate information about any number of topics just because it could hurt the current order, we are once again in a dark age of information repression and tyranny. If we are not allowed to think or believe these things, whatever they are, it's even worse. Yes, we can almost all understand what objective reality is, or at least acknowledge that it exists with a few rare exceptions. The problem comes in with perceiving and interpreting that reality. Humans are not perfect, we are flawed in many ways and we get things wrong. So the room for error is essential. These considerations now to terrorist label some pieces of information and then act to intervene if someone believes them, even if it was just momentarily until new information changes that perception, is probably the most severe breach of the social contract that could be made between an authority of the state and the people that they are supposed to serve. Restrictions of speech, which we have now, is essentially as bad as it gets. It limits our ability to describe how we see the world, to voice concerns and what to do about it. Today, they just label it hate speech or racism in order to justify why someone should be silenced. But restricting or limiting people's beliefs which this document is aiming for, is the final frontier of oppression. It's magnitudes worse than limiting speech and takes us towards a, an unpredictable dystopia. Here's the core of the problem. The establishment is drumming up a scare about the people that they see as an existential threat to their power and the new global order that they are building. It's uh, nationalism versus globalism. This is where the line is being drawn right now. You're either on one side or the other. We're looking at major corporate power in bed with principles that can, for the sake of simplicity's sake, be defined as uh, socialist international or Fabian socialism. This is third way politics, therefore, it's a joining of two different forces. We're talking about liberal free market economic policies and big transnational banks that are in bed with progressive social political forces who all want to internationalize the world for different reasons. The establishment has avowed enemies. They use labels, loaded terms such as white supremacist, white nationalist, racist, fascist, and Nazi, even if they are not true, obviously. And then with the aid of the media's repetitive narrative, they are linking the people that they smear with those labels to terrorism and to violence. This is the new trend we're seeing now. Because this gives them the justification that they need to shut down and target people that are bringing to light views and perspectives that they don't appreciate, that they don't like. The establishment is afraid today because of a succession of recent events, pushback essentially. They view these people spearheading this pushback as enemies and a major threat. People talking about nationalism, tradition, even a decade or two old conservative values are seen as a major obstacle. If these people who make up this anti-globalist collective, whatever we want to call it, can continue to speak freely, wake people up, potentially even go into politics or other positions of influence and expose the flaws of the system, the failure of the society that they want us to live in, they might be out of power one day. They might either be voted out or maybe even hauled out. Not that I'm encouraging that obviously, but uh, you know, speaking of possibilities, who knows what the future holds. Uh, people are getting angry. 
and they're getting angry for a reason. So what kind of society are they envisioning to keep themselves in a perpetual state of power? The historical trends have sadly always been towards greater centralization of power, never the opposite, but there is a limit to it, and that is why empires fall. Even the nation state at one point was a massive centralization effort on a scale that we had not seen before. Now they want a globalized society though. I'm fine with trade, travel and tourism between nations obviously, but what we're seeing now is something completely different. It's a new experiment. Multi-ethnic, multi-religious societies and therefore divided societies. No more nations, no more borders. Sounds great to some starry-eyed internationalist, I bet, right? Like a John Lennon song. Well, that is not the future that we are getting. That is not how this goes. They rule through chaos. This will be a future more akin to a dystopian movie than some pipe dream of a hippie who didn't understand human nature. It will be sectors and checkpoints, ubiquitous surveillance, paranoia, no trust, collapse of civil society, violence, maybe even robots patrolling the streets one day, overseen by a centralized artificial intelligence to keep track of us all, our movements, our speech, and even our thinking to make sure that we obey. As we reach carrying capacity of these former broken up nations, or these sectors, there will be conflict over territory and resources. We're already seeing some of that in the early stages of this today. And the most likely scenario is that the trends we see now will continue to be reinforced. We will have stronger ethnic in-group solidarity, and the lines will be clearly drawn, therefore, on uh, what group you belong to. This is why Malmö is in free fall, and Swedes are leaving that city. It's neo-colonialism with new ethnic groups. And then they will compete with each other once the Swedes are gone from there, once a white flight had purged all the Swedes from Malmö. It's uh, like a war zone in that city. It's a pattern that will follow most large cities in the West as well. And so they're using this in a specific way. You see, the more chaos, the more justification for control from the top there will be. They will promise to keep us safe, which they won't be able to do. But this is how they justify their existence. You need us, they'll say. Well, people at that point will have forgotten that all of this was orchestrated by them to begin with, intentionally. The era of a peaceful, homogenous nation might be a faint memory at that point. Make no mistake about it, these international forces are immensely disruptive and powerful. They have already opened the borders and mass waves of migrants are coming in to disrupt the usual internal affairs of nations that have been targeted. Now, this is being done for a specific reason. This is being done to prevent a nationalist revival. They do not want nations that can rise up and fight back. This is the work to prevent that. They're laying those foundational stones now. These newcomers are also pawns in a much larger game and they are predictably used as a new voting block in addition. Something that increasingly is preventing people of European descent from overturning the establishments in these countries and, and the global establishment by essentially voting in new politicians, outsiders, that can put a stop to this, makes it harder for them to come in. Breaking down ethnic homogeneity is one of the primary goals in the West because it will ensure a path towards a world globalized, shaped in their image. So they are seeking to prevent a grassroots opposition from forming now. Hence we see targeting of people who hold no significant influence or power, but smear is the primary tool. Destroy people's reputation, drag it through the mud, to make sure that other people are scared away. If they ever even would accidentally trip over some of your shadow banned or suppressed content, if we're talking about people who are vocal online about these kinds of things. So the new strategy now, definitely also in America going into 2020, is to claim that white supremacists are exceptionally violent and white nationalism is terrorism. The big lie is that this particular faction is more violent than others, which is just not true. We've seen waves of Islamic attacks in Europe and the US. We've seen waves of SSRI pumped school shooters who lack a political motive for the most part, as far as I know anyway. We've seen waves of Black Lives Matter shootings of uh, police officers. We've seen waves of supposed white supremacist shootings. And more recently, we've seen waves of far left Antifa violence, shootings, assaults, and kind of guys firebombing ice facilities and shooting at them. There are shootings at gaming conventions, at back to school parties. And there are shootings by criminal gangs and thugs every week in many parts of the US and Europe now. Yet all of these others are not currently being processed the same way in the media. So this is a lie. This is uh, intentional. 
There are people from all walks of life, from every different field, political faction, and group on that on rare occasion turn to violence and target people in mass shootings and other kinds of attacks. There are racially motivated attacks against whites, but this is another faction, there's another issue that's not being highlighted. But it should be said that if the establishment truly were concerned with people lashing out, limiting people's free speech by choking out their reach and leaving them fewer and fewer avenues to be heard, this is not going to help. This is not the way to keep people safe. Quite the opposite. So if we cannot discuss ideas, concerns and solutions, what do we have? If we can't use the language needed to describe reality because it's labeled as hate speech, what can we do? And even worse, at what point do they intervene into what you think and what you believe? What will they do if you refuse to give up these beliefs? I mean, who are these people that are going to tell us what we can think? What do these people believe? What wacky beliefs do they hold? Do we get to examine their minds and what's in their innermost heart and intention? They are telling us that they do not have biases nor agendas of their own. Are we just supposed to accept what they tell us to believe? This authority is going to tell us what is true and what is lies? Who is the judge and, and where is the jury? The internet was this revolution where we could communicate and share ideas, research, come up with new concepts and mass communicate, reach endless amounts of people. But now the establishment has grown bitter because this amazing new technology has been used to expose them and so many of their lies. Their underhanded, wretched tactics to manipulate and obfuscate have largely been exposed. It just hasn't reached the masses quite yet. But that time is coming if we can continue and continue to have free speech. Today they just call it a conspiracy theory and they expect you to believe anything they tell you. They want you to obey, they want you to shut up, they want you broke, destitute, controlled and your children, their subjects to do whatever they want with, including reassign their gender with surgery, indoctrinate them and break their spirit and tell them that they're evil for who they are. They claim conspiracies are dangerous, that if some wacko gets the wrong information and decide to act on it, that the whole system is destabilized while ignoring the, the wars and the mass murder that comes in the wake of these same elitists. The reality is that it's far more dangerous to allow a small elite clique who hold all the power and influence to tell us what we can or cannot believe, what we can or cannot research, what we can or cannot investigate. It's far more dangerous to have limits to free speech and let an authoritarian despotic leadership control all the information and tell us what the truth is. If they manage to attain a legal right to target, harass, spy, wiretap and eventually even imprison people who refuse to conform to their version of reality, we are screwed. This will be a world where we are gaslit into thinking that we are living in a society that doesn't actually conform to reality. They claim conspiracies as make-believe, but at the same time the entire system is right now actively involved in trying to make you think that, well, men are not really men and women are not really women. Things that are plain for everyone to see right in front of their face, that isn't really what, uh, what we think it is. It's something different. Look, it's simple. They have an agenda and they are involved in one of the biggest conspiracies that our world has ever seen. And they are trying to fool us into thinking that it's not really happening, it's not really taking place. I'm talking about the substitution of an entire people in a major part of the world. The foot soldiers of the establishment and the talking heads that are making millions propping up this dying system are in fact praising these radical, extreme and genocidal plants. They can say it and they can point out the reality when they say that it's a good thing. Whites will, will not be the majority. I mean, that's it's an exciting transformation of the country. It's an exciting evolution uh, and, you know, progress of our country among white supremacists, white nationalists. That is viewed as a, a horrific event. These leaders are living insulated lives well protected from the unwashed masses that they are making decisions for. They tell us we live in a democracy, an open society where everyone's voice matters and that concerns are to be taken seriously by everybody no matter how outlandish they are. Never have the system told us that we need to show more compassion and be more sensitive while if you come up against the edges of the playpen that they have designed for us, the wrath of the entire apparatus will crush you and do everything they can to grind you up. From the media, the fifth column, to the academics, talking heads on TV, the corporations, musicians and the politicians, 
They all more or less operate in unison to crush effective dissent and voices that do not agree with the direction that our society is going. Jeffrey Epstein admittedly ran a sex ring with underaged girls that was about blackmailing and controlling influential and powerful people in the highest halls of power and influence in our society. So they could be molded and wielded by Epstein or whomever used him as the frontman. These people were a tool for his own gains or their own gains. And that he mysteriously died in his cell and we are now told by the same lying, dirty, dishonest and fake press that it's just a conspiracy theory to think that there is something foul behind all of this. They killed him in order to cover it up before it all came out in court. Who believes these people anymore? How much is enough? How much more are you going to take before you speak up about this? Tell your friends, your family, your co-workers and plant the seeds of doubt in their minds about the rotten nature of the class of those ruling over us. Telling us what we can believe or they will classify us as terrorists. How much more proof do you need? How much more of your daughter's or son's future will you let them ravage before you admit that they have crossed the line? We don't want more violence. We don't want more rape and more crime. We want stability, security, and a future for our children that isn't just bearable, but something that is actually better than what we had. Right now, we are living in an absolute horrendous time. All over the West, it's going to hell. We need peaceful removal of compromised politicians and unelected leaders who are in positions of power. No more secret societies and Bilderbergers and NGOs and closed rooms of compromised pedophile politicians that are doing what they are told without asking us, ruining our future and our children's future. To conspire just simply means to breathe together, to make secret plans jointly between two or more parties. In other words, what the others who weren't involved in the conversation doesn't know about. That's what makes it secret, right? And theory just means a supposition intended to explain something. They are trying to make us believe that this isn't something that's happening. The reality is that this is happening every single day in every part of the world. People talk with each other, they make agreements, and it's not known to the larger masses. Now, we might not always know the exact plot or the scheme or even between whom, who the parties were, but we sure as hell can see the trails of it and the rotten fruit that it bears. You might not see the mosquito landing on you, sticking in its little schlong and sucking your blood, but you know goddamn well that it was there when it begins to itch. Us fighting back and winning relies on us accurately being able to identify and explain what it is that's happening. So they have one method left to continue to hold power and influence, and that is to do what all despots do, and that is to enforce restrictions, more control, severe punishments. They use the frustration and rare cases of violence that we've seen by people who lash out because they feel like they have no option left as justifications for clamping down, for limitations of freedom, limitations of free speech and freedom of assembly. Authorities have revoked the right to protest and have intentionally caused havoc between opposite political factions in order to create chaos on the streets intentionally. Then they use this as an excuse to punish and push back against the kind of oppositions that could serve to topple their ivory towers someday in the future. If these people who are concerned with these kinds of questions were allowed to organize organically into groups and grow unfettered without the intimidation tactics, uh, threats of violence, smear, defamation and involvement of feds and plants to derail organizations and activism that is based on genuine concerns and miscontent, we would be getting somewhere. But they play dirty, they play foul. In fact, everything they do is scheming. Everything they do is a conspiracy. And that is the fundamental reason why they don't want us to be able to talk about it and expose it. Thank you for watching, guys. If you like what you see here, redice.tv and redicemembers.com is our website. Check out the memberships. Great way to get access to everything that we do. Everything is on there. All the stuff that has been censored now from YouTube is on Red Ice members. So get a membership, donate, get a t-shirt, whatever you can do. Thank you so much, guys. We'll be back with more soon. See you next time.